Now, so you, you became an Anglican priest. How long were you an Anglican priest? Oh, uh, not. I'm trying to know if it was even a year. Um, very short, very, very brief short. time. Wow. So, yeah. so obviously, by the time you you became an Anglican priest, you were already pointing pretty pretty much towards Rome. It seems like because I assume that's why you left the Anglican priesthood was to become Catholic, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, you know. In college, I got really into the Protestant Reformation and Luther and Calvin, and especially reading Calvin, I, I saw he was quoting, you know, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux. He's always quoting Augustine. Um, sometimes we'll quote Jerome or Chrysostom, and I began to be really interested in these early fathers. Now, this was before the internet, Eric, <laughs> and. Uh, our gray we hairs have, prove we were around. Yeah, there, we right? didn't have access. I mean, I remember being in college around sophomore year or something and asking my friends if they knew of any books on infant baptism. Couldn't find one at the library. I mean, you couldn't. There was no Amazon. You had to actually go to a Barnes & Noble or a Christian bookstore to find this stuff. So doing research was very difficult. But I remember reading, I think in college, taking a class on King Arthur. And in one of those stories, um, the knights go to mass uh, before a battle or something like that. And I remember as I, and there's archbishops and priests. I remember thinking they're Christians. I'm a Christian, but their Christianity is entirely different than what I know as a college kid in a evangelical moving into a Calvinistic milieu. I mean, there's something back there in time that's closer to the apostles that I don't know. Now, being raised in Texas, I think, especially, I was raised in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, Fort Worth, Texas is very sort of Methodist and Episcopalian and Baptist. Um, kind of old, you know, ranch money and, you know, it's still Texas. Right. It was kind of assumed, you know, when I went to high school, the only, I knew a bunch of redheaded kids that were Catholic, Irish kids. And then all my Hispanic friends were Catholic. And I think just, you know, growing up in Texas in that environment, um, it was sort of assumed that Hispanic is Catholic. Uh, it's not something that for some reason I I thought was something that I would get into or follow. And then I also kind of saw the Marian devotions, which are deeply embedded. Now I see in a very good way. Right. in Latino culture. But I thought that's kind of weird that people have tattoos of the Virgin Mary on them and they have airbrushed Guadalupe on the hood of their car and, you know, these kind of things. I just thought it was very exotic and strange. And so I, it's hard to know in my mind going back to, you know, as a college kid, I knew there was this ancient Christianity, but it didn't seem like that would be Catholicism, even though there were some of the same words. And so I think over time, I was kind of drawn to Anglicanism because it has that sort of, it sounds old. They say bishop and priest and deacon and liturgy and even mass and sacraments and their churches are beautiful and their stained glass and altars and altar rails and all these things. The theology still is essentially Protestant even though the trappings and the terms are there. So as I was sort of passing through Anglicanism and studying the early church, getting to know real Catholics, uh, reading contemporary Catholic theology, Council of Trent and all that, I was starting to, to understand what is the Catholic church. I guess so I thought later on as I <laughs> was a Catholic for a while, I realized that there's a lot of problems in the Catholic church. Maybe we can right. talk about that today as well, but that's that's my journey. And, you know, I was very pro-life, seeing the pro-life witness of the church. Early on, uh, a Catholic girl shared a um, cassette tape, this is pre-CD, of Contraception, Why Not? Oh, yeah. I listened to that, and I, was, I thought that was very convincing, that it was philosophically sound. So I began to admire Catholicism for its pro-life stance, for its teaching on matrimony, for its teaching on against contraception. And uh, it was really just a, a matter of time before I came all the way through. Right. So what year was it that you uh, came into the church? 2006. Okay. So r right after JP2 passed away and so under Pope Benedict. Correct. So when you were, when you, when you came to church, would you have called yourself at that time 
you might not know the term, but would you consider yourself like a JP2 Catholic, a Benedict Catholic, somebody who, like a conservative Catholic? I mean, there's a lot of different terms for it, but the reform of the reform, hermeneutic continuity, all those terms, is that kind of what kind of Catholic you were when you first came in? You know, I, I've i never, I, I've always had, you know, I kind of had an admiration for John Paul too, but since I had never been under him mm -hmm. uh, my entire life, uh, he was really just a, like a holy card or a picture. So right. I, I don't think I would ever have said I'm a JP2 Catholic. I greatly admired the 16th Ratzinger, right. and he was a huge part of my attraction to Catholicism. And uh, I read a lot of his books as an Anglican. Um, in fact, it's interesting. I was reflecting on this the other day. My wife brought it up, and I'd forgotten it. When John Paul II died, I was finishing up Anglican Seminary. My wife and I were very moved. We watched it on TV, CNN or whatever. And then my wife and I agreed, you know, we said, well, we're not Catholic, but the Pope just died. Maybe we should go to Catholic church this Sunday and pay our respects to the Pope and then just kind of see what the Catholics have to say about the Pope dying. Right. Interested, you know, it's a very Anglican thing to do, by the way. <laughs> yeah. It's very Anglican, you know, so we'll just, you know, we'll just check in with the Catholics. And this was right. in Wisconsin. When I was in seminary at Neshota House. And we went to the Catholic church. It was either the next day or Sunday. And I tell you what, Eric, it be mo a large, I don't know what the percentage is, but a lot of people in the congregation were wearing Green Bay Packer jerseys at mass. I had never seen this as an Episcopalian, Anglican, Protestant, that people would wear jersey gear to mass. So I was like, that's weird. The other thing is, is there was a baptism, I believe, towards the beginning or something. And the priest got a, like a beer pitcher and there was like a holy water font. And he kept on scooping holy water and dumping it out. And as he was doing this, he was explaining to the congregation that there is no such thing as holy water because all water that God made on earth is all holy. Jeez. And I was thinking, man, we Episcopalians aren't even that liberal. That's pretty right, lame. Right. That's, that's dumb. And then one of the epistle readings was, um, I think it was First Peter or Paul, and the priest let us know right away a sermon that Peter didn't really write this. Right, of course not. And I remember thinking, what, what is going on in this place? And this is right after John Paul II died. I'm like, are we going to talk about the Pope that just died? And then I remember during the consecration, Eric, he had all the children come up and stand in a circle around him at the altar, which was kind of in the middle. It was like a square church, but but the altar was in the middle and he, he made up his Eucharistic prayer and it rhymed. Oh my God. And I, the only rhyme I remember was it was something like the night and bef before in which he was dead. He took bread. He rhymed the word dead and bread. Oh my gosh. Of course we didn't receive communion because we weren't Catholic and we know you're not right, supposed right. to, but I mean, I mean it probably wasn't even a valid Eucharist. It sounds like. I, I, I mean, we we were used to altar rails and ad orientum and chant and you know oh my god churches built in the shape of a cross and stained glass and we were scandalized i think we kind of thought well maybe catholicism's true you know let's go check out to say the pope we left that place thinking these people are like more liberal than anyone we've ever seen it was, and they're it was probably, a complete joke yeah and the people that perish were probably very proud of how relevant they were and how they were attractive to people. But what's right. happening is exactly what happened to you. Right? I mean, I get it if you're on the team and you're playing and 20 minutes after mass, you got right, to wear right. your jersey there or whatever. But right, right. I was just like, I don't know. It just seemed like the congregation was in sync with the priest, which was basically the message, this doesn't matter. We don't even care. Right. So and I think we different. left there. Yeah, we left there thinking, being open to Catholicism, and we left thinking, Holy water isn't holy. Peter didn't write first Peter or second Peter, whatever it was. Uh, the Eucharistic prayer is just this sort of communal hold hands. Everybody get in a circle with the kids, kind of make up their own Eucharistic prayer. I think we left that day thinking, well, that's not it. Right. Yeah. I don't blame it, but yet God's, but yet works. not long after that, we actually did come in. And that was really because uh, Joy and I, went to Rome. And I think the kind of the existential trigger for me was being ordained an Episcopal priest 
and then running up against philosophical and moral problems pastorally with people where I felt that I couldn't compromise. For example, mm-hmm. doing I was doing wedding counseling for this couple, and about halfway through, I just said, now nah, I just want to pause here. Do y'all believe, are y'all Christian? Do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? And the groom was like, no. And I was like, why are y'all here? And I'm like, well, the church is pretty and grew up here. And I was like, well, I'm not marrying you. And they're like, you can't do that. I was like, yes, I can. I'm not, you're not getting married in this church. You don't believe in Jesus. And, and I, he's like, why does it even matter? And I said, I can't ask a dead man, Jesus Christ, to bless your union if he's a dead man. And they were, they were really offended and upset, but I was running into this kind of stuff. One of them, oh, I preached a sermon against abortion. I think I even mentioned contraception in it. And one of the prominent laymen came to me and he said, hey, we're all pro-life here. You're pro-life. I'm pro-life. But we shouldn't ever talk about it in the pulpit because it's political. I know you're a young priest. You don't know this, but you shouldn't do that. And I was thinking, well, I'm going to preach on it every Sunday. I mean, this is this is not even high theology. This isn't even like summa theologiae. This is basic thou shalt not kill. Right. And as a priest, I should be teaching this to the people. Right. Like this is my my moral obligation. So I, I kind of started realizing that pastorally, I didn't have a magisterium. I didn't have a catechism. Um, I didn't have a tradition behind me to enforce my convictions. And that kind of created the crisis for me saying, okay, well, maybe I can revisit Rome and Rome can find that for right. me. And that's, so you, you- so you became Catholic. Now, I assume you were eligible to become a Catholic priest, correct? As soon as I came into the church, I was immediately put on the track for ordination. I was made, you'll like this, Eric, I was made lector, acolyte, Eucharistic minister, and candidate for holy orders as soon as I came into the church and I was on track to be ordained a priest. And you'll be interested, Eric, of which bishop gave me, my, uh, made me rector, acolyte, Eucharistic minister, and canon of orders. Who's that? Guess who? Uh, was it Farrell? Now, Cardinal Farrell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. he is thanking God or whoever he believes in that that didn't go through, that you didn't go all the way through. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, so but then I you stayed on that track. Not to do it. So why? why yeah, I stayed that? on that track for a, a year or less than a year. Um, and my intention, I mean, I wasn't a hundred percent, but I was moving towards it and exploring being ordained a married Catholic priest. My wife Joy was pregnant with our fourth child. We now have eight. And it, what, during that year is when he was born. I began to realize, well, man, we're in our late twenties. We have four kids. Would Definitely going to probably have more unless something happens to us. Uh, That means we could have six kids, seven kids, eight kids, nine kids. And then as I got to know priests and and know the diocesan structure, and I got to know some bishops, and I had a little interaction with, back then, Archbishop Wuerl, because we were in D.C. at that time, North Virginia, D.C. I realized this is not where God's calling me to be. I'm not, even though kind of in my early adulthood, I felt called to be a pastor and to be a teacher and a preacher or whatever that means. I said, you know, I need to find a way to do that, but not as a priest. Right. So. We were both in DC area at the same time because I was there when, uh, in the, in that time as well. And yeah, I, I can understand meeting all the people like Bishop, Archbishop Whirl and whatnot. And well, my very to- first few weeks in DC, I was taken to a meeting and I met Carl Carrot. And had a had a meeting with Cardinal McCarrick, um, and then Whirl and Farrell, and yeah, I mean, I was definitely embedded in that diocese, and oh my goodness, got to meet some interesting characters. And I think, you know, that part of my story and part of my biography is my initial dunking into Catholicism was in DC. Um, right during that time period when McCarrick was handing the reins over to Whirl and Farrell was there and, and all those things were happening. That's, that is where, I mean, I became a Catholic. I was received in the church in Fort Worth, Texas, and a week or so later, I was in D.C. Oh, wow. um, and I was working out there in the archdiocese. And um, yeah, so it's personal. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. this is first, and, and no one did, did, did me wrong. Um, right. You know, I had a good experience, but that's when I started seeing the cracks, 